I dreamed about a world without water. The oceans were dry, the lakes, the streams. All the rivers I had canoed were gone. Robert Perkins, there you go. Are people watching the the Zoom call or only our written and spoken word? Uh, you're you're being shown, but not live. This is a pre-tape, so yeah. Okay, yeah. they'll see the tape. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're seeing okay. the real Rob. I'm having dinner. I'm having dinner <laughs> of a tuna fish I caught today. Oh, cool! That's really cool. And um. I've given up any pretense of uh, making winter a virtue, and I grew up in New England, and I live in southern Utah, and it's cold and snowy, and I don't care to make a virtue of it anymore. So I'm in the town of Lamu, Kenya, which is warm, just about on the equator, and wonderful. Hey, I was wondering when, when, and why you uh, you moved there because I just noticed on your site that you live in Kenya in a in a um, uh, hay build uh, structure. I don't live here. No, not at all. Oh, okay. In southern Utah, <clears throat> in a place that is quiet and remote and off the grid, <clears throat> this is close to the silence of the tundra that I've ever been able to come. And I live there with a fixed roof. I don't have to listen to the rattle of the tent in the wind. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. I'm actually glad that your internet's working too. So because we're far away because it's uh, quite late for you mm -hmm. uh, right now. It's probably eight o'clock and it's just noon for me. So that's why I'm, I'm having dinner and I do apologize for missing our earlier date. But here I am. And you had a question or two for me. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, um, you know, I was going to ask you the typical things about what got you to Woodlands Travel and what are your influences. Uh, but I think the one important question has always been in my head the last couple of days when I wanted to talk to you is I've known you as an incredible filmmaker, a poet, uh, a, a writer, uh, an artist. In fact, someone even called you the Lou Reed of the documentary filmmaking. And I just think that really is kind of cool that that matches, right? So of all those things, of all those films, they've done you know, quite a few films and a few books, whatever. What is your main genre? What, what is your, what, what really excites you? Is it film, is it writing? Well, I was, uh, as a kid, I just loved books and I loved words and I loved writing. But I found a medium in film <clears throat> that allowed me to have both the things I loved most, images and words that came together in making a film as you're talking you're, and your visual, both at the same time. And there was a young poet named George Starbuck. And he was being interviewed once. And uh, the interviewer said, well, when did you become a poet? And he looked at the interviewer and he said, no, no, that's not the right question. The right question is, when did you stop being a poet? Yeah, throughout the years, uh, I, I, I teach uh, some um, students, unique students that actually have different al alternative learning methods. And if they get a little stressed in class, I used to put uh, a couple of your films on. It would calm them. And it was your voice yeah. and your words. So your films were more poetry than actually visual. So if you look at your first film, uh, Into the Great Solitude, well, I'm not sure if it's your first one, but the probably more known uh, film. Very pretty. Very pretty, yeah. Now let's see your other profile. Yeah, that's right. You are the invertible seek seek of the North. You are the seek seek of the North. You, you put so many shadows in that film, and I understood why. Could you tell everybody why you actually filmed so many shadow scenes? Appalachian sunrise meets 
I think it's pretty practical when you're in the Arctic and the sun doesn't set in the evening, you have six to eight hours of shadow time where the shadows stretch out and uh, you just get fascinated with them. And that's what I was fascinated. And I filmed them. Now you've gone back to the, the back river many times, right? Mm -hmm. I have. What that's draws all you? I've that's all I've done. Yeah. I think a lot of people like me or are similar to me. I don't know how many solo canoeists there are, but canoeists in general always want a new river. They want something new and different. When I decided early on that I would go back to the same river and continue going down it, which it never was the same. The water levels change. I change. But I know more about the back river watershed than anybody else in the world. And I'll say that even Native people, because of the 30 to 35 years I've been traveling on it. Um, so I decided to just go back to the same watershed. The first film was Into the Great Solitude. And during that film, I thought about my father and recorded conversation about him and my relation because he was ill before I left. There's an Irish myth about the son of a father who's dying, who goes on a quest to find something that will cure the father, an elixir. And he does. He finds it uh, through, trial, through great trials and tribulations. But I think I have it. And I think what it is is understanding I've, that's the elixir. And the elixir is really more for me so that I can understand that he's going on the journey that he's on and I'm on my own journey, and <clears throat> understanding that allows me to let him go if I need to, if he dies, but that it's uh, part of life, that it's all right, and this is a gift that the trip has given me, and I just hope I get to be able to get home in time, not even necessarily to say it, but just to show him that I you understand. The second film, seven years later, was called Talking to Angels. And my wife, uh, no, my wife-to-be, had breast cancer, and I was reflecting. I shared the film with her, so you get her journal and my journal together. And I think it's a very um, compelling film myself. And I've been criticized because how could I leave a woman who was going through treatments and go on a canoe trip. And it was kind of a setup uh, because the producer I had at Channel 4 in England said, you're a traveler, Rob. You can't stay at home and make a film about your wife. So I had to go on a trip. And uh, she agreed with that because she wanted her story told. We didn't think she would die. And the telling of her story would become a part of her work as a psychologist. And that's how it played out. Unfortunately, she didn't survive. But the film had a 20-year presence in the medical community because if someone has a life-threatening illness, all the attention in the family and friends goes to the person who has the illness. And the partner is often left aside. So the film we made was the two of us talking about it. And the film became useful for people who got stuck in their conversations during a life-threatening illness. And they could watch the film as an objective thing. And then it would start conversation between them. And that was what a wonderful gift that my first wife, Rini Goodell, gave to people by saying we should do that. I wonder where the progress is 
when we stop believing in things like angels and a multitude of gods. The um the interesting thing about that, can you explain to everybody the, the title of that, Talking to Angels? Well, <clears throat> as a 19-year-old guy growing up in the culture that we grew up, um, I slipped out of the regular vein of people and I had a psychotic episode, it's called, and I was locked up for a year. I'm a big guy and if I get upset, it upsets other people. So at that time in the late sixties, I was put in a mental hospital and coming out of that is what gave me the impetus to do the trips that I took. Cause I didn't really like people. I didn't trust them, but nature was my companion and nature was non-judgmental. And uh, I was also proving to myself I could be self-sufficient by traveling, as I did. Um, and I was lucky. I mean, a bear didn't grab me. A rabbit didn't tip me over. I didn't run out of food. And um, I've lived to be 73 years old and just did a trip last summer for five weeks of solo travel on the same rivers that I always have loved. Wow, wow. Now, I find also, too, in that film, Talking to Angels, and all your films, too, you have that deep thought, but you have a really good sense of humor. <laughs> and one of the greatest lines in that well, film. thanks. Oh, you really do. It, it, yeah. One of the greatest lines is, you've never understood the classification of rapids from one to five, because if you tip in a one, that's a five to you. That 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 is so deep thinking, but hilarious. <laughs> if, if you went back and looked at the footage of that shot, you'll actually see a fly walking across the, uh, a mos you know, a mosquito, I guess, or a black fly walking across the lens of the camera, which I think only adds to the <laughs> poignancy of the human. Is it, <clears throat> yeah, no. I uh, is it tough, Rob, for you mm -hmm. to, to uh, go back home after those trips? I mean, you're out for 50 to 60 days when you do these trips, right? I am. And as a kid, it was hard for me. And I was overwhelmed by going back to a city life. I mean, I came out of Boston and I would return to Boston and it was just overwhelming, sensorily, sensorily. I didn't do well, but as I've gotten older, I've been able to balance it better. The contrasts are more interesting to me than overwhelming to me. It's, it's you broke away too, and you did some unique uh, places in films instead of the wilderness. Uh, actually, I think one of my favorite films, to be quite honest, is One Man in a Boat. And thank you. It's very, again, deep thinking. I mean, that scene where you meet the little girl and she wants to be rich, she wants to be a pop star, she wants yeah. to make, make lots of money. And that tells a lot. Yeah. You know, where you met the uh, older yeah. gentleman in, in the pub, and he goes, Well, I'm in my time. And you said, Well, you are in my time. Like, incredible <laughs> or, or when you yeah. got attacked by the goose and you're like yeah. wildlife um what was thing, the, the thing the thing to me before we get to your question is i never scripted my films and i think that's one reason they survive in terms of longevity they're as interesting today they're a little dated but they're still interesting because i wasn't writing a script i was responding to the moment i was in so when I met the little girl, when I met the man in the pub, when I was attacked by the goose, it was all present time. And, and I think that shines through and is one of the reasons my films have a longer life than some. Did When you did that film, did you get some critics say, why are you not in the wild places? I, I did a similar trip on the Thames River in, in Ontario here, and it was through- You an did? Area. And actually, because of that film, I actually I wanted to do the same Huck Finn feel to it, right? And um, but yeah, some people said, "Well, why are you in the North, Kevin?" So did people sort of say, "Why did you do such an urban river?" No, I think they were more interested in the fact that I went up country. I mean, hundreds of miles, not through only one river, but many canal systems. Um, no, I didn't get criticism for that. I. Some people appreciated it, all the different accents they got to hear as I moved north in England. Um, 
I was asked if I wanted to make another film, and I said, yes, I'd like to carry a letter from the oldest member of my family in Boston to the head of our Scottish clan. And that was the premise of the film. And I called the head of the clan when I was in London, and he said, fine, fine, come on. And as I got closer and I check in with him, he got more and more nervous as to why this American was carrying a letter all the way from London by canoe and not put it in the mailbox. <laughs> I think it just made an incredible film. I, 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 again, some of the great moments when you were in the mansion having dinner after dumping in the rapids and your eye roll, the eye roll was just <laughs> perfect. <laughs> My first great one was the gypsy lady who came to the front door asking for food. She was told to go to the back door, um, mm. to, the, to the kitchens. And on mm. the way around, she died. Oh, no. Which was rather oh, a long way to the kitchen, mind you. Well, it's a long way to the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. It's all the way around the back yeah. crack. Mile and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Through there, yeah. up the yeah. Yeah, the eye roll was perfect, but they were people that were acquaintances of mine, and they did not appreciate the way they appeared. But that's one thing about making films that's just true. The camera captures what's going on, and most people want to try to want to tell you their story, thinking that if they can tell you their story, you will think, or the audience will think better of them. And that's not necessarily true. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 as writers and film people, we all have to deal with that. I, I just finished my memoir, and of course, my sisters and my mom were like reading it. They're like, "When did that happen, Kevin?" So yeah. One. Uh, the title of your memoir. Uh, another bend in the river. Life is another bend in the river. You don't know what's around, whether it's white water or calm, but. You know, that's that what happens. So actually, it was about basically growing up with high anxiety and going into nature to calm myself. So, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Yeah, well, he does do that. One of the insights I had last summer was that the river is full at the headwaters and full at the mouth. It's not like a, something filling up or draining. It's always full. And so it's always flowing. And to me, that's the present moment. Being on a river is to be in the present moment. It really is. The, the beautiful uh, statement too, when you made it in uh, One Man in a Boat, where you got to Scotland and you looked at the river and you said, I just want to grab it and swallow it. It's almost like, a, like you just want, yeah, roll up in a ball and yeah. But God, look at this. This is it. I found that pieces of solitude here. Yeah. I'd love to take it and just sort of hold up my little ball. Mm, eat it. I have the solitude in me. <laughs> I don't know how I thought of that, but I'm proud of myself. When I do look back at my films, I'm proud I did them. Well, you, I mean, they, you, you, you went outside the box, too, when you actually all of a sudden you were following uh, John Muir's 1,000 uh, mile walk, walk in a motorcycle with a sidecar and a dog. And hilarious yeah. and really good storyline, to be quite honest. I think that's why I like your stuff so much. There's a storyline to it. It's just not nice visuals. And what, what I right. found really interesting is I, I always uh, admired John Muir's writings and all the, the idea of him creating preservation and stuff like that. And falling on the orchid uh, when escaping in northern Ontario but not the world suffer from the banishment of a single weed that sort of thing right but when you did that were you surprised that nobody knew who this guy was when you were traveling the states well I was not surprised as much as disappointed and life moves on and that's partly why I wanted to make the film was to bring his life back in front of people who saw the film because he was a very unusual man who connected God or spiritual life to the earth we walk around on and that wasn't done in writing before his time and he was so good at it and he did make an effect in the bigger world <clears throat> by being the father of uh, the national parks in the U.S. Um, so it was a tribute film. I wanted to, I couldn't thank him, but I could thank his spirit. Is it the same thing when you when you uh, went down the Connecticut River 
uh, you met a lot of people. I forget the name of that film. What was it called? Um, uh, Home Waters. Home Waters. Home Waters. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you met so many different people and, and caught the real character on camera. I love that. But my favorite was the bear scene because I teach a, a class where it's a debate class, environmental debate, right? And I show that scene about, first of all, you reacting, uh, the guy that killed the bear react, and then the, the, the bear rehab center person react. And then all of a sudden I put it out to my class and it's it's just a war. Yeah, Sam, that's my sport. You know, they, uh, I like to do that there. Yeah, it's a good sport for me. I, but I was a coward. I couldn't tell the man my opinion. I couldn't tell him how awful I thought it was because I could just see he saw the bear, he shot the bear. It's what he does. And he said it was for sport. I think if you define sport, it is a competition between two willing and consenting adversaries. I don't think that bear walking through that cornfield consented to being part of the sport. It's murder. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting project. Yeah, no, I, I found the bear to be also one of the key conversations or scenes in the film. But the one I really appreciate the most are the guys that are racing snowmobiles on grass in the summer. And that led me to make the comment, what do they do in the winter, race lawnmowers? <laughs> Even that moment where you see the man uh, yeah. say, look, here's a man outstanding in his field. Like very comic, very, and, and it's not scripted, which is fantastic. So. The the one uh yeah. one film that was very uh, interesting to me was cr the Crocodile River, and there was a lot of the yeah. going on a lot of again different people, but there was a moment where you said you didn't feel welcome. What was that all about? No, I, well, I'm a white man in a black world, and I was traveling outside the European bubble for twelve weeks, going down the Limpopo River, which is the border between South Africa. Africa and Botswana and Zimbabwe and it flows out into the Indian Ocean through Mozambique. I've never been on more unfamiliar ground and I wasn't comfortable either with the nature because everything in the nature I didn't know or appreciate. Like if I if I say to you a blue a blue jay, you know what it sounds like. You know what it looks like. But the birds I was seeing in Africa <clears throat> I had no idea what they were doing and the sounds at night. And I held up a little tomato looking thing in front of my camera and I asked my companion who's African, how about having this for dinner? And he says, yeah, we could eat it, but it would kill us. <laughs> and I, I didn't understand any environment I was in. <clears throat> and um, I was proud of the fact that I tried to be a bridge between a world that we don't know anything about in North America. And my impetus for making the film was that I believed there was an everyday, normal, wonderful life in Africa, which we didn't hear about because we only heard about the droughts, the slaughter, the corruption. <clears throat> and I thought, no, there's more to the story than that. And that was my impetus for going on the journey. Um, but I was never been more out of my depths in the world, <clears throat> except perhaps at the end of the film called uh, Yankee in Kamchatka, where they take me for a ride on a vehicle they think would be good for bird watching. That was a that was a crazy film because you think of the time you were the first uh, American to be invited into Russia after World War II. Yeah, it was like seventy five years later, and and really intriguing. What was yes. going on with your group was great. It was a true canoe trip in a wild area, and then all of a sudden a tank shows up, and <laughs> it was full of surprise. And the Russians we were meeting uh, were mostly military people who were camped out on Kamchatka waiting for the opportunity to invade America. They were part of what's called the KGB. And when they saw us, me and my several companions, they kind of got upset because they thought, well, we're probably not going to get that war we wanted. 
Wow. And um, <clears throat> I had many interchanges with people who, um, I don't know, they just had a different attitude about Americans. And uh, they were very unenthusiastic about us. Not unlike the way we're split today in our politics in the U.S., it was interesting though, but that but the, your your uh, the nationalist uh, filmmaker that you met, uh, he, he was different. He was a part of your mindset. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. Well, yes, he, he was a wonderful man. <clears throat> He's passed on now. His name was Vasily Peskov, and he had for twenty years he had uh, a half an hour every week to talk about nature, and in the Soviet Union during the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. There were only two stations. And if you had a half an hour, I mean, he was more famous or as famous as Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra when in America, their voices went through the radio for the first time. I mean, they were so famous because of the radio. And he was so famous because he had that half hour on the programs. <clears throat> That's why he was able to get us permission to travel in Kamchatka. The head of the KGB, who ran Kamchatka <clears throat> invited, you know, Vasily said, I'd like to see you. And he said, fine. And during their interview, the head of the KGB said, what do you, can I do for you, Vasily? And Vasily said, well, I want to go to Kamchatka. And he said, fine, Vasily, we'll set everything up. And then he said, but I want to bring six Americans with me. <laughs> and he goes, oh, no. <laughs> and, uh, but because Vasily, personality and renown we were able to do our trip <laughs> I, found it, I found it interesting yeah. that film too where is it, it it proved that nature um doesn't have a boundary right it, it, it is what it is so so people ask you what kind of rapids there are up here and they class rapids in canoeing terms one to five and i always think it's sort of a silly thing because if you tip over in a one that's a five to you it is what it is <clears throat> that touches on a question I have asked myself now while I'm finishing my new book. I did want to mention that I am finishing a new book whose title is um, When It's Dark Enough, You Can See the Stars. Is life merely a lesson in loss? Or does it have a sister, one that smiles? Along with the half dozen animal beneficiaries, there would have been birds, at least seagulls and ravens. A hundred yards from the body, I found a small sparrow's nest lined with the soft kiviat. I got down on my hands and knees and turned over the skull to see a colony of small jet black beetles scatter in the grass. The last afternoon, I realized that one more creature had been nourished by the muskox. But one of the questions I'm addressing in there is, is nature really something that, we're, okay, we're always asking questions in our culture. We, we have the scientific tradition and we have a rational tradition and it's always asking, what's the answer? Find the answer, discover the answer. And you know, maybe there isn't an, an answer. I've never thought of that before. But nature may be just going along as she is, and it's us who impose on her all of those rational thoughts that she's going to doing this and this and this and this. Is it, I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, it, but it, it does, because in, in one sense, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I have the scientific mind because I'm a, I, I worked in fish and wildlife, did wildlife studies and, and everything else. And even was a forester at one time, right? But then I turned it. Yeah. I turned into outdoor education instead. I left all that ah. outdoor education. Is there two separate minds? Like I'm sort of that artistic mind that actually deep thinking, but then also I was the practical. Well, I, you know, we identified this species, and this is why. And to try and combine those, mm -hmm. should they be combined or not? But look at it from a slightly different point of view. Um, nature may be looking at us wondering why we have those two points of view. Nature is just itself. And in my terms, I, I call it always a loving indifference towards us. A it loving is, indifference. It is true because I, I do, I, when I teach my students of fish and wildlife, I said, do not name the species you're studying. You don't want to humanize the, the species. So when we're tagging bears, don't give the, the bear 
Teddy for name. Okay, that's wrong. It's bear. Why number not? Two. Well, so why that, not? That's true. That's it, true. It makes the bear an ob object at a remove from us. Yep. Yep. And in a sense, I think our whole mission today is to get a little closer to the things in nature. And one of the things that separates us is using that effing word, it, which just makes it a little easier to discount that other living being who in its most basic elements is just like us. It has a heart, it has a stomach, it has a liver. And we've treated them very poorly. I'd say most people's attitude outside of our circle treat the earth like dirt. Yeah, it's it's like, well, John Muir said it, Thoreau said it, the anthropocentric views of, of humans will destroy the species. And also at the end, <laughs> will destroy themselves, right? Anthropocentric, it's me, it's self-interest. In fact, when I talk to a bunch of hermits that live in the, in the, in the far north, they always say self-interest will be the demise of the human species. That's where I come in, because the point of our lives is to tell a story. And what kind of story are we going to tell? Are we going to be a storyteller about rape and pillage and development? Or are we going to be a story about the sacredness of species and the earth? But what you just said to me puts the huge emphasis on we need to tell stories that have heart. More and more stories with heart. Yeah, and that's what that's what your work has done. And even the one uh, uh, film we didn't mention is uh, the blind blind bird singing rain. Uh, yeah, that as well. Yeah. Not gorgeous. I think your poetry and your voice really is emphasized in that film. I, I wanted to say something because you written me. I'm not a poet. <clears throat> I really, you know, I was married to a woman named Claire Klub, and she was a poet. And she'd look at me and say, "Oh God." Oh, you take so long to talk about what it is you want to say. You should be a poet. I might be poetic, but I'm not a poet. That's a, that's a good statement. Yeah. So I, you're, you're all the, yeah. 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 But I was very happy with uh, what was his name, Richard Horan's uh, critical, his film critic, Richard Horan, who said I was the Lou Reed of documentary filmmaking which is something you and I understand, but younger people may not know that he was the lead singer and guitarist in the Velvet Underground. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rini, if you hadn't seen a muskox, you wouldn't believe they could exist. They look like one of God's irrational thoughts. They seem out of a myth. Science and monotheism may have driven the gods from Olympus, but not the muskox from the Arctic. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left here, so I wanted to just uh, end on, the, what is this, the, the canoe, uh, blue canoe uh, newsletter? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I took a five-week solo journey last summer, and I am writing a post about the experience of being on the river five weeks, and at my age, and also, it's a guide to how you would do a trip like that. What do you need? What's useful? The tips that I've learned over the years are included in the thoughts that I have. And it's called the Blue Canoe dot life. <clears throat> That's how you can be connected to it. That's fantastic. And it's, That's a yeah. it's a precursor to the book that will come out in two years called uh, When It's Dark Enough you can see the stars. So the book is uh, another year or, or two in the making then? I've written the book, but it takes uh, a year to sell it and a year to make it. So I'm saying two years. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I love your, your stuff. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, you've mm. actually expired me throughout my entire life and uh, still do. So <laughs> thanks a lot for the chat. Well, yeah. And uh, I'm glad uh, you're, you're still... Uh, not a poet, but doing nice words about nature. <laughs> What's that? Wait a minute. What are well, you pulling up there? It's uh, <laughs> it's early here for me, so I thought I would just have this in my tea because it is a whiskey chat. Very good. <clears throat> well, I God bless you and thank you for the interview. I've enjoyed it.
Bye. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. You could point to the map and say, that's what I did. But is that really what I did? Really? I think there's been a whole other journey that overrides the physical one. That truly is the journey. It's the daydreams that I've had while I've paddled. It's the meetings that I've had along the way with the wolf, with the bear, with the peregrine, with the little sparrow, with the fish, with the bugs, with the sunlight, with the rocks, with the little flowers. The thousand incidents that you could put on a string like that popcorn for your Christmas tree when you were a kid. <laughs>